The title of my sermon this morning is Messianic Prophecies 5, The Messiah Will Spend a Season in Egypt. In 1995, after spending 49 years in Los Angeles, the Rams moved across the country to St. Louis and became the St. Louis Rams. Now, the Los Angeles Rams weren't that bad of a team. I, I don't think so. 1951, they won the National Football League Championship. This was before the Super Bowl. And then they played in Super Bowl fourteen and lost to the, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1980. This move was a heartbreaking move, of course, for the fans of the Rams in Los Angeles, who spent, had essentially a 50-year relationship with this team. Over the past 20 years, the St. Louis Rams have had some ups and downs. They, they've had some good times as well as some bad times. In the year 2000, they played the Tennessee Titans in Super Bowl 34. Interestingly, in 1996, the Houston Oilers moved from Houston to Tennessee and in 1999 became the Tennessee Titans. So you have two teams that both moved playing each other in the Super Bowl. But with a 24-16 lead, the Rams gave the ball back to the Titans who started on their own 12-yard line with a minute and 48 seconds left in the game. Over the next minute and 42 seconds, they drove, the Titans drove down the field ended up on the Rams' 10-yard line with six seconds to go. Six seconds to go in the game, the end zone in sight, no timeouts left. The Titans had time for just one more play. Right there, Cox. Throws right side for Tyson. He goes for the end zone. He came up one yard short. Tyson Campbell with a touchdown. One yard short of, it, of the Super Bowl tie, at least. They would have, would have had a chance to tie the game. So the young St. Louis Rams won the Super Bowl by with a yard to spare. So a yard to spare, they won the Super Bowl. Two years later, they returned to the Super Bowl and faced the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 36, which they lost as a result of a game-winning field goal by Adam Vinatieri. I'm not a big Patriots fan, so that bothers me. Unfortunately for the St. Louis Rams, that was about the end of their success. They made it to the playoffs in the year 2003 and then 2004, but since the year 2003, they have not had a winning record because they finished 8-8 eight and eight in 2004. They have not had more wins than losses since 2004. All of this was why the Rams owners requested and were granted permission to move back to Los Angeles and they're going to play the 2016 season in Los Angeles. Interesting fact, the head coach of the Houston Oilers slash Tennessee Titans during their transition from Houston to Tennessee, as well as during Super Bowl 34, was a guy named Jeff Fisher, who happens to be the head coach of the now Los Angeles Rams. He essentially it was involved in both teams' transitions or moves from one position to another. So let me get to the point here. I mean, you might be wondering, what in the world does this have anything to do with what the Bible says about anything? I would say that moving is one of the more stressful things that we could ever do. For those of us who've moved know this. I mean, I've heard a story several times from Earl and Beverly about when they moved up here, there was like four feet of snow on either side and how difficult that was. Teresa says six feet. We'll see. I, either, either way, I can envision how that would be stressful. I mean, when we moved up here, I mean, I had to drive a U-Haul and I had a dog in the side seat with me, I believe. And I, I don't think so. No, we didn't have a dog. What am I saying? But we, I had my, my, my wife with two kids in front of me. We had a slide attached to the top, flapping around the whole way. Drove all the way up from San Diego. And, and it's stressful moving, especially when you unload all those boxes and realize that now you have to unpack it all. It's very difficult. Moving is not a fun thing. It's a very stressful thing, and I can imagine that even the, these two teams having to move could be stressful on their, their players, the staff, as well as the executives. It wasn't an, it isn't, and wasn't an easy thing for them to do. This morning, I want to take a look at one family who made a pretty big move. And this family, of course, was Mr. and Mrs. Joseph of Nazareth and the newly born <laughs> son, Jesus the Christ. As we study the prophecy that predicted that the Messiah, the predicted the Messiah has moved to Egypt, as well as Matthew's depiction of this event, I want to take a look at how Joseph reacted to the situation. How did Joseph react to these stresses? And in doing so, we're going to try to apply this to us today. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now. I ask that you put a very special touch on me as I try my best to declare your word accurately and apply it to a, in a way that every one of us are going to partake in it today. So, Lord, I thank you, and I praise you in your wonderful name. Amen. If you have your Bible, let's start off by turning to Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11. And I want to read Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 down to verse 4. And this is what we would call 
the prophecy, but as you're going to find out, it's kind of an interesting prophecy. It's one of those that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And, and there, there's some question regarding it, and I'll explain that in a moment. So Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 down to verse 4. Hosea is right after Daniel in the Old Testament, if you're having a hard time finding it. Hosea chapter 11, starting at verse 1. The prophet Hosea writes, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called him, the more, okay, the more, they, the more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of men and with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. So really, again, that verse 1 is the key here. That's the prophecy, if you want to call it that. And like I said, I'll explain in a minute. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So let's give a little bit of a context. Let's kind of gain a little understanding here. Who was the author here? We have Hosea. He, he calls himself Hosea, the son of, where did it go? Son of Bere, B E E R B E E R I, Bere. We believe that Hosea's ministry, well, we may not believe it. He says his ministry spans several decades and several reigns of kings of both Judah as well as Israel. Hosea chapter one verse one tells us that his ministry began during the reign of Uzziah, king of Judah. Uzziah's rule lasted from the year seven ninety to the year seven thirty nine B C. So it is probable that Hosea's ministry started near the end of Uzziah's life and reign. So um, somewhere near the end, somewhere closer to the year 739 B.C. than the beginning of this. Um, Hosea served the Lord throughout the reigns of Jotham as well as Ahaz and died during the reign of Hezekiah, whose rule began around the year 107, uh, 150, or 715 B.C. after a period of vice regency with his father Ahaz. So you kind of gain, a, kind of seeing a... A length of time and understanding what's taking place. He he ruled during several, or he was he served during several kings' rules of the kingdom of Judah. But interestingly, Hosea's primary focus was the kingdom of Israel, was the northern kingdom. Yet he only lists Jo. Let me try to say it, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. It's the only king of Israel that Hosea mentions in the beginning of his stuff. For whatever purpose, we don't know. And Jeroboam reigned over the northern kingdom from the year 793 to the year 753 B.C. So a little bit of historical background. All the events of these, the reigns of these kings, the, the information regarding their reigns we can find in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 down to chapter 32. So those are several chapters. Hosea began his ministry near the end of a period of military success and prosperity for both Israel as well as Judah. So both kingdoms of Israel. During the first half of the 8th century, Assyrian influence in the west had declined, allowing the kingdoms of Jeroboam II as well as Uzziah to flourish. However, the situation soon changed. As foreseen by Hosea, the Assyrians under Tegleth, Tegleth Pesler, Pesler III received their, or revived their expansionist policy in the west in the year 70, um, 770, or 733, 733 and 732 BC, the northern kingdom was made a puppet state within the Assyrian kingdom, or the rule of the Assyrian Empire. Um, after plotting a, re a revolt, Israel was defeated in the year 722, at which point the Assyrians sent the Israelites everywhere else. They deported them into what we understand as the exile. Now the final four chat. Well, let me back up. Judah was also incorporated as a vessel state. Vessel state's a little bit different. They were essentially ruled over, but you know they were not as rule. I don't know. How I said Israel was ruled a little more strictly than Judah was. We see this in Second Kings chapter sixteen. So, now the final four chapters of Hosea, the section of scripture that we're kind of looking at here, really focus on God's love for Israel. In Hosea chapter eleven, verse one through four, we we see. Um, God speaking through Hosea, he reminds his people of their past, how he brought them out of Egypt, how he showed them great love, and yet they were stubborn and rebellious. As a whole, as Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 is not prophetic. There is no prophecy. And what I mean by that is 
the people of the Old Testament would not have understood this as referring to the Messiah, let alone the future. So this kind of brings up a question on why did Matthew quote it? And I'm going to address that in a moment. So nevertheless, really the point of all of it is that the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to do what he did. So let's take a look now at Matthew. You can, you can leave Hosea. You read, we read the, the prophecy, when Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And now let's go to Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13, which is where we're going to really focus this morning. So Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13. And let's start off by reading verse 13 down to verse 15. So verse 13, we just, um, Rufus read earlier about how the Magi came to visit. It's probably about two years, not probably, it more, more, more than likely around two years since Jesus had been born. They live in a home now. The Magi come, they give him gifts. The Magi leave a different, different direction as we read in verse 12 because they, God came to them in a dream and told them, hey, don't go back to Herod. 13 down to 15, Matthew chapter 2. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Of course, that prophet is Hosea out of Egypt. I called my son. So again, an interesting thought. Why would Matthew quote a scripture that maybe not really prophetic? At the same time, the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to write the book of Matthew. And as a result, we need to look at it as inspired. So here's kind of an interesting thought as well. Even though, like I said, on the surface, Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 does not, is not prophetic, there is there are quite a few parallels between the essential of the history of Israel and the life of Christ. And let me tell you about them. Israel's flight, pretty much the history of, um, of Jesus' flight to Egypt as well as Israel's history. As an, as an infant nation, Israel went to Egypt just as Jesus did as a child. God led Israel out and God brought Jesus back. And both events show God's working to save his people. So you kind of see how you know, Jesus and Israel left Israel, left that land, and they went to Egypt. And then they got out of Egypt as well. So let's keep on reading Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 down to verse 18 now. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very and very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused <coughs> to be comforted, because they were no more. So in a bloodthirsty fit of rage over the possibility of someone else rising up and taking over his throne, Herod had all the children, the male children under the age of two, slaughtered and killed. This was to fulfill what Jeremiah had, um, had prophesied several hundred years earlier, you know, which is in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. An interesting like, thought with Jeremiah's prophecy referred to Rachel. Rachel, of course, was Jacob's favorite wife. Jacob became known as Israel and was the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. And she was also the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Thus she was one of the four mothers of the, of the people of Israel, of the tribes of Israel, weeping for her children. The tribe of Benjamin, the territory that they have is within five miles of Bethlehem. Bethlehem itself is in the territory of Judah, given to the tribe of Judah. Benjamin's tribe, meaning Rachel's son Benjamin's tribe, is within five miles of the town of Bethlehem, which I wonder if that had some significance. And I also might just be looking into it as well. So let's keep on going. Verse 19 down to verse 23 now of uh, Matthew chapter 2. But when Herod had died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. 
So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard Archelaus was reigning over Judah or Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. They Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So Herod the Great is dead. He died. Before he died, though, he realized quite quickly that the relationship that he had with Rome, which was very good. Herod the Great had a good relationship with Rome. Rome gave him a lot of a lot of, how do you say it, a lot of authority. Pretty much Herod can do whatever he wanted. Herod's sons weren't going to be given that same authority. So instead of Herod giving his kingdom to his oldest son, he divided his kingdom into three. And, and this is the map that you see here. If you kind of see the key there. Herod the Great had, was the king over all of this region, while his three sons were not kings over these regions. Let me tell you about his three sons. Herod Antipas, we know him. Um, quite well, what we hear about him in the future of the uh, of the Gospels, and he ruled over the regions of Galilee and Perea. And you, so you kind of see the uh, that area, the area to the side, right above the Dead Sea, on the other side of the Jordan, as well as Galilee. Herod Philip II ruled over the region of Tarcontius, which, as you see, that's kind of the where did it go? Out there. And then finally, Herod Archelaus ruled over the regions of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Now, interestingly, this is kind of why we have to understand, we've got to look at the historical background of this. Why was Joseph afraid of going back to Bethlehem? Well, the first thing this guy did, Archelaus did, as king of this area, was kill 3,000 people who did not like him. So as a result, Herod, or Joseph had a pretty good reason for not wanting to go back to Bethlehem. Which God, of course, led him in the right direction. Said, hey, go to Galilee. Which was, again, everything kind of makes sense in the long run. In the end of it, Herod Archelaus was booted out of his throne. He wasn't allowed to be a, a king anymore by the Romans. They kicked him out because of this, obviously. So, Another interesting thought here. Kind of funny that we're talking about um, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, in the Old Testament, does it say that the Messiah will be a Nazarene. I mean, there's one location that I'm going to tell you in a minute, but theologians are not 100% certain that Matthew's quote um, regarding the Messiah being a Nazarene is actually in the Bible. There's two possible thoughts. One, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, possibly could say that Jesus is a Nazarene, or that the Messiah would be a Nazarene. Let me read you from my New American Standard. It says, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Hebrew word for branch and the Hebrew word for Galilee are very similar. And some people believe that it's misspoken. I have a problem with this because I looked at the words and I, I you know, listened to them both and they don't, make it, they don't sound at all the same to me. So, but my commentary said that the other alternative is that Matthew was quoting a prophecy that is not in the Old Testament, which is also very possible. Once again, if we say the book of Matthew is inspired, we've got to take it at its word. I mean, and understand that this might have been a spoken prophecy that had been understood from a long period of time that was never recorded in what we have of the Old Testament. So let me kind of get to my point here before, you know, so we can finally get to my application. What can we learn... In regards to dealing with our trials and hardships, because we all know we have trials and hardships, from Joseph's reactions to his situation, as well as to God. And I'm going to make three points. First of all, Joseph trusted God. Joseph trusted God. An angel of the Lord comes down and tells him, hey, you need to hightail it out of here, because Herod's going to kill your son. And I would assume that would also possibly involve, you know, Joseph and his wife as well. I would hope that he would trust God. I mean, if an angel came to me and said to do something, I think I'd trust God too. But we need to back up a little bit, because I bet Joseph wasn't 100% understanding what was taking place here. I mean, I understand Joseph, he, he made this long trip. He was forced to go there because of the census. He's not in his hometown anymore. They're, they're from Nazareth. They're from the, the Galilee region. Joseph and his very, very pregnant fiancée Make the way there, and she gives birth in a barn. Finally, Joseph, you know, he settled down. Two years go by. I'm assuming he got a job. I and mean, now the wise men come and give him gifts. He's, he's doing good. 
And then God tells him to move. And not only move, he tells him to move in the middle of the night. If God came and told me tonight that I needed to pick up everything before daybreak and hightail it out of here, I'm probably going to have a question or two for God. And I might protest a little bit. But not Joseph. And that's the point. That, that's kind of what I find amazing. Matthew does not say anywhere that Joseph questioned God. Joseph, all he did was trust God. Joseph trusted God. How about you? That's really that's the application here. Do you trust God even in the midst of hardships and trials? When you're dealing with a difficult situation, do you trust God? My favorite, one of my favorite Bible verses, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Lean not on your own understanding. That's the hard part. Because sometimes I just want to lean on my own understanding. I mean, God, let me, let me deal it for, for a while. I'll trust myself more or less and just do my own thing. But that's not what God said. Trust Him. And don't try to figure it out on your own. Because you know what? If Joseph tried to figure things out on his own, he would probably, we, we would have, probably have a problem. But Joseph didn't. He did it. He trusted God. He knew what was going on. And he just allowed God to be in control. Turn to me to Romans chapter 8. Keep your finger here in Matthew. We're going to go back there in a moment. But Romans chapter 8, verse 28, all the way down to verse 39. Another amazing section of Scripture. One of my favorite sections of Scripture as well. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, down to the end of the chapter. So Paul writes to the church in Rome. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who, call, who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He, meaning God, foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. So that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, and these whom these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And this is really the key part here. What then shall we say to these things? So again, that kind of my thought would be: What then should we say to dealing with hardships or difficult situations? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? And how will God, I mean, God gave his own son for us. What else does he need to do to prove that he loves us and prove that we can trust him? Uh, verse 33, I think, yes, verse, 40, verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly, we, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. And then the, the triumphant entry of the chapter. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The point is, there's not a single thing that we can ever come across that will ever separate us from God's love. We have absolutely no reason not to trust God. Joseph trusted God, we can trust Him too. So when you are facing a confusing situation or a difficulty in this life, turn to the Lord and put your trust in Him and everything will be okay. So trusting God involves your mind. It involves believing in Him and having faith in Him. But obeying God is when your trust, belief, or faith gets trans translated into actions, which is my next point. Joseph obeyed God. It, it really makes common sense. What good would have Joseph's trust of God been if he didn't also act upon that trust? 
I can say I trust God, but if I don't act upon it, what's the purpose? Joseph trusted God, but if he didn't pick up and hightail it out of there, it would have had no meaning. We need to act upon our trust, and that's what obeying God means. We obey God when we trust in Him, and we follow through with what He asks of us to do. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, meaning you're going to do what He says. If we love God, meaning we trust God, we're going to do what God says to do. Luke chapter 11, verse 28, or 27 and 28, While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you in the breast at which you nursed. But he said, Jesus said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Do you obey the word of God? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 down to verse 23. Matthew says, really Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, will, the, does the will of the, my Father, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We need to trust God, but we need to also obey Him as well. Just the, you know, the follow through is really the point. You need to follow through with your actions. Turn me to James chapter 1 now. James chapter 1 verse 19. Again, keep your finger in Matthew. We're going to kind of return there. You can probably just leave Matthew. I've already read everything from there. So James chapter 1 verse 19 down to verse 25. James chapter 1, verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren. Of course, James is the brother of Jesus. Literally the brother of Jesus. The son of Mary and Joseph. And, and James didn't come to know Jesus as the Messiah until after the fact. You figure, imagine spending, what, 30 some odd years with your, you know, your brother who's the Messiah. The one you've been waiting for as a Jewish person all your life. And not recognizing him. I don't know. I mean, you, you figure some of the disciples must have slapped themselves on the back of the head. You figure James really hit himself on the back of the head. And be like, what, what happened, you know? So, verse 19, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of a man, of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, But prove yourself doers of the word, and not merely, merely hearers who elude them, or delude themselves. For, I, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. We need to be more than just hearers of the word. We need to act upon it. Don't just trust God. Be obedient to God. It, they go together is the point. They don't make sense separately. You need to have, you need to trust and obey. We didn't sing the song this morning. We should have. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We need to trust and obey God. That's it. Bottom line, there's no way around it. But sometimes, and hey, this is the interesting part. And this is really where, for me, with the sermon, it kind of it made a lot of sense and kind of pushed in this direction. You know, we need to be active Christians who are doing whatever it takes to advance the kingdom of God. And sometimes, advancing and trusting and obeying God involve waiting on God, which is my third point. We trust, we obey, and we wait. Joseph waited on God. Joseph trusted and obeyed God and picked up his family and moved to Egypt. And then he waited. I don't like waiting. I'm not a patient person. I get frustrated. I need to do something. I can't just sit around and do nothing. I need to do something. Can you imagine? Joseph moved from Nazareth, got comfortable in Bethlehem. Now he's moved to Egypt, gets comfortable in Egypt, then God's going to move him back. 
lots and lots of moving and lots a lot of waiting in between. But sometimes the waiting's important. We need to be patient and wait on God. The Bible does not say how long they waited on God in Egypt. But the fact is that they waited for further instruction for God. That's what they did. That's all Joseph did. God didn't speak to him in the meantime. God said, hey, wait for me to tell you what to do. And who knows how long that was? A year maybe? Several years? We don't know. Sometimes we need to wait on God. I mean, have you ever waited on God before? And I know you have. I mean, for me... Uh, when I, I finished, I got my Master's in Divinity, which is what pastors typically get in the spring of 2012. I had already started applying for different churches. And some of you know I sent out more than 200 resumes, and not one of them got called back except this one. I mean, I, talking about waiting, I'm like, God, what's going on? I don't understand. And of course, in, in hindsight, it was like a year and a half I had to wait. And I mean, you figure there, there are other people, I mean, the Israelites marched around the wilderness for 40 years. They had to wait a long time to actually get to, the, get to the conclusion of their journey. The point is that sometimes it doesn't work out the way we think. Again, trust in the Lord with all, with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust God and allow Him to guide you. Sometimes God wants you to wait, even if you don't want to wait. You need to trust Him even when you are waiting. Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Turn me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. We've been in Isaiah a lot the last several weeks and we're going to continue to be be in Isaiah for the next couple of months as we go through these different prophecies. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, down to verse 31. If I can flip the page. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, down to the end of the chapter. The prophet Isaiah writes, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is insecurable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. We become stronger when we wait on God. I mean, the more we trust and the more we obey God, the stronger we become in that waiting time, that period of time that we get stuck waiting is sometimes good for us. We become stronger. And you figure, I waited to become a pastor while I was in seminary. It's kind of an oxymoron if you think of it. I was studying to become a pastor. I was becoming stronger in my faith in order to achieve this spot where I'm at now in a way that's going to make sense. Like if I became a pastor before I was prepared, what good would have I been to you? It just doesn't work. James chapter 5 verse 7 and 8 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early Until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is near. So now the question I had. And I'm sure the question you have as as well is why. Why does God make us wait? Because I mean again for me. It just makes a lot more sense to speed up the process. Why does God make us wait? The, The truth is. I don't know. I don't know why God makes us wait. But one thing I do know. Is that things always work out. In the long run. God's plan is always better than any plan we could ever come up with on our own. Nothing I could ever come up with is ever going to make sense. Yet God's plan is always perfect because God has the plan. He has the plan set up for us from the beginning of time. Waiting on God involves trusting and obeying God. You see how it's a cycle? You trust God. You follow through on that trust by obeying Him and then you wait. Then you trust God again. You obey God. You wait. It's a common cycle. Because it's how we become stronger in our faith. It's how we become closer to God. We trust God. We obey God. We wait on God. And then we start the process over again. So let me close up now. 
Sometimes trusting, obeying, and waiting on God is nearly impossible for mankind. Sometimes there are situations that take place within our lives that just don't make any sense to us. I think about the Israelites in Egypt as they wandered the wilderness. And even before that, they were God's people. They were the people of Israel, the tribes of Jacob. And yet now they're enslaved in Egypt. They're being forced to build pyramids. And in a, kind of in a similar way, you think about the African Americans within our own country. I mean, they were taken away from their families in Africa, dragged over into our country and made slaves, treated horribly, disrespected. And then after the Civil War ended, you would think everything would be okay, but that was obviously not the case. A hundred years passed before anything ever changed. But then, of course, uh, with Monday being Martin Luther King Day, I, this is a quote I found. Martin Luther King is quoted as saying, Faith has taken the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. And isn't that the truth? And this, of course, he took this from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convention, the convention of things not seen. And then James chapter, 20, verse, or chapter 2, verse 20, the second half, Faith without works is useless. Sometimes we face trials and hardships in this life without much of an explanation from God, but that does not mean that He is not in control. God is 100% in control of the situation no matter what. No matter what we think. You cannot see the big picture that God sees. His plan is perfect for you. You might not be able to see the end of the tunnel, but you know that the end is there because you can see the light. And of course, that light is Jesus at the end of the tunnel. You don't see it all, but you know it's there. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. If we trust, obey, and wait on Him, and He will make your path straight. So trust God today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now as we close. Lord, even in the midst of difficult times, and we all face hard times, we all face trying situations and hardships in this life, some greater than others. But we still face them. Lord, when we face them, help us trust, obey, and wait on you. Help us trust you like Joseph trusted you in the midst of his difficult situation, his trying situation. Lord, help us know that you're a God that loves us so greatly that you want to know us and you want to have a relationship with us. We are not just meaningless beings that came about as a result of evolution. We were created perfectly in your image. From the beginning, right from conception. Lord, I thank you and I praise you now. I ask that you bless each and every one of us. Help us know that you're a loving God. Help us turn to you in our times of need. And help us trust you and obey you and wait on you no matter what the circumstance. In your wonderful name, amen.